We started at the beginning in Acts chapter 1, and, and they were seeking after God. They continued, rose from there into the power that God promised us, this miraculous, life-changing, giving life power of God that he said that he would give us. Sometimes we overlook what God has said that we could have. He said, I give you power. Not just power, like, like strength to do things. It's, it was the power of the Spirit of God that goes before us and does what we cannot do. And notice in Acts chapter 2, they were all filled. I, I have to correct something from what I heard last week. Instead of rushing wind, I said Russian wind uh, quite a few times. And so I just, I don't know what a Russian wind is. It's different than an American wind, but I know that. Uh, but uh, if you caught that, I guess last week as well, I, I said we went to Boo at the Zoo to see the Christmas lights. That is a false statement. Um, <laughs> So, uh, when I'm up here preaching, sometimes my mind is a little bit behind my mouth, and so things don't come out correct or whatever. And so, but it was a rushing wind, like something, anyways, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Acts chapter 2, verse 1. I want to step back and kind of read all the way through this. Um, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one accord in one place. That's awesome. <laughs> I hope you catch that. When I go back and reverse here in a minute and show you why that's so cool. They were together. Because before this happens, they were not. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing ING at the end of that. Mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting and appeared unto them cloven tongues like his fire. And it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues. And the Spirit gave them utterance. This is why they were speaking in other languages. And then there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation and under heaven. Now it was noise abroad that the multitude came together and was confounded because that every man heard them speak in their own language. And they were amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these speak uh, Gal uh, Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own language? Wherein we were born? And then... It goes on and it lists all these places proving a point that these men were speaking, but every man heard in their own language. And by the time we hit verse 12, and they were all amazed. We're in doubt, saying one to another, what meaneth this? Now there was others that mocked, saying these men are full of new wine. Something was happening. Revival was breaking out. The power of God went beyond the situation that they were facing. They were from all different languages, and the Spirit of God came and did what they could not do and of their own abilities. So the power of the gospel began to spread. But I asked how. I talked about that vessel last week, and I used that illustration of that clear thing about out of the inside that God cannot fill us if we're full of ourselves. God cannot fill us if we're full of sin. God cannot put what is holy in something that is unholy. It doesn't work that way. We can cry out, say, God, fill us, God, fill us. And God cries out to us and says, empty, empty yourselves. You're, you're so full of what I am the opposite of. How can God show his glory through that which is sinful? Verse 14 blows my mind. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and saith unto them, men, he men of Judea and all that dwell in Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken unto my words. The next 20 some verses goes into one of the most powerful messages ever preached in the word of God. The spirit of God was there. He was working in the disciples, the moving of God through the words, the changing of hearts. Now jump down to the end of the message after Peter is preaching in verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? They, they, they responded to the Spirit of God. Like we said, the Word of God went out. The Spirit of God went out. And they responded to the Word of God. Verse 41, when they gladly received His Word, they were baptized. And the same day they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Now, let me remind you, this doesn't just happen. It doesn't happen. There was a, a spiritual break. You remember how we were talking about that spiritual wall? Remember, go back in the book of John, Matthew, Mark, Luke. That, that, that what were they dealing with? They were talking about Jesus. The theme of the people was crucify him. 
all right, let, let's bring out Barabbas and maybe you'll choose him. No, we let the, let the killer go. We want Jesus dead. There wasn't a good spirit here. There wasn't a good attitude here. It was spiritual warfare that they were up against, but on that moment, when Peter got up to preach the word of God, all of a sudden, God knocked down a wall that was there before. And the Bible tells us that they went from 120 to over 3,000 people that accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior on this day. So how did this happen? Well, God works through us. We are the vessels of God. We are tools to be filled with the Spirit of God. Now I can imagine. Let, let me go back just to this illustration that I was talking about last week is that, that platform. Let's make this our platform, okay, of sitting here. And, you know, you can imagine all these people are out there. I mean, there was 3,000 people that got saved. There was others that doubted. But all of a sudden, they have this platform. And I, I, I've, I've seen movies and stuff that try to express what this looks like. All I know is the disciples were back here. Let's, let's just use all these vessels. We have these vessels over there. The disciples were back here being like, somebody's got to step up and preach. Man, God is working. They're listening. Somebody has got to preach. I, I Probably Matthew or, oh, John, man, you're the one that was closest to Jesus. Man, you, you love Jesus. James, you were in the center, you, you were in the uh, inner circle of Jesus Christ. But it was Peter. I'll do it. That vessel that was no different than the rest of the guys. That one that was filled with the Spirit of God just like the rest of the guys. Walked to that stage and began to open his mouth where the Spirit of God began to work through him. Read that verse again. But Peter, it was planned. The Spirit of God was there. The Spirit of God was at work. And the Bible tells us that there was 12 disciples because they still replaced in Matthew or Acts chapter 1. They replaced uh, uh, Judas. In Acts 1 15, the Bible says that there was actually 120 followers of Jesus Christ. Out of all the disciples, out of James and John and the others, out of the 120, I have to stop and say, why Peter? Can we just be real? Because I'd be like, dude, out of all of us, you're the one that Jesus confronted that would deny him. You're the one that fell asleep when we were in the garden. You're the one that went hay, haywire and jumped up and cut off the, 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 the ear of the man when God said not to. You're the one that not only once, not only twice, three times, three times you denied Jesus. Guys, we're not talking years ago. We're talking days ago. Two months about the time from this to where Peter did all this. I'm just going to talk how we think. Peter, I appreciate, man, we love you, buddy. I mean, I, come here, come here. Let me tell you. I, no, I don't think so. I'm just being real. I mean, I, I, the whole Gospels are intertwined with the story of his failure. And you think you're going to step up there and bring one of the most passionate displays of God's power in this? No, I, 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 I don't think so. God was working here. Can, can we honestly say God showed his power through the wind, the, the sound of the wind. God showed his power through the fire. God did all these things. Why, Peter? Before you question this, I'd like to dig into it a little bit. Take your Bibles with me. We're just going to re reverse and go forward again. Matthew chapter 26, verse 31. Follow along with me. See, I, I need to make something very clear that God knows your past. God wasn't sitting there going, oh, I, so I didn't realize that. I forgot. <laughs> That's right, Peter, you did do that. God knows your past. Can we just lay that out there just so you know? You're sitting there saying, nobody else knows my past. Let me tell you, God knows your past. Peter's mistakes are intertwined through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We see it all the way through there. 
God planned it out. Let me just make something very clear. Peter loved God. We're not talking about somebody that ran off and said, I want nothing to do with this. No, this was somebody that was with Jesus through all of this. Jesus meets with the disciple before he goes to the cross in Matthew 26, verse 31. Then saith Jesus unto them, All ye shall be offended of me this night, for it is written, I will smite the shepherd and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. Remember when I said how cool is it in Acts that the Bible emphasizes they were all together in one accord? Because when Satan, when the pressure came on, you know where they were? They were splintered in everywhere. It's amazing what happens when the Spirit of God is in the midst of Christians that are seeking and praying and wanting God. See, Jesus was giving them a warning. This is Peter failed to recognize his weakness. You want to know what happened and for us too. Peter failed to recognize his weakness. Peter stood up and said unto him, Though all the men shall be offended of thee, yet I will never be offended. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, that this night before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. This wasn't Jesus predestining his failure. Jesus knew his pride. Jesus knew his problems. Jesus already knew this. In, in verse 35, Peter said unto him, Though I should die with thee, yet I will I not deny thee. Likewise also said the disciples. I'll tell you, this is, this is the mindset of all of us. I mean, it's just the truth. If I, I, I grew up in church. I know the word of God. I follow after Jesus. Man, there's something inside of me that knows the truth. I, I, I have this conviction and he just stands up not being, trying to be arrogant. Just like, hey, I love you so much. This isn't uh, no, it ain't going to happen. <laughs> I, I appreciate you even saying that, Jesus. Do you know why we've studied fasting and praying? Because let me tell you, this your spirit indeed is willing, but your flesh is weak. A lot of times we don't experience the power, power of God and the outpouring of God because we don't recognize our, our weakness. By, by verse 41, Jesus has to wake up Peter. Watch and pray that ye enter not to temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. You know, most of our past failures begin with this idea. I've got this. You start flirting with people online and you're a married man or married woman. It's like this, I shouldn't, I've got this. You start slipping off to drink with the guys after work and you know that you shouldn't be doing that. And it's like, it's not bad, I've got this. You're dating somebody and you're taking it too far and you know that you're taking it too far. I've got this. It starts in our head. Spiritual warfare. I've got this. It won't be me. I'm not going to be a statistic. I'm not going to be like everybody else. I've got this. Spiritual warfare. Jesus even says in this passage, Satan has desired you, Peter. He wants you, Peter. You're facing something bigger than you are, Peter. Next, we go to Jesus' arrest. He's taken to the trial. The disciples are scared. They weren't spiritually ready for this. And by verse 69, And Peter sat within, without the palace, and the damsel came unto him. Thou also, thou also was with Jesus of Galilee. And they denied before all of them, saying, I know not what thou sayest. And when he was gone out of the porch, and other maids saw him and said unto him that were there, This fellow also was with Jesus of Nazareth. And again, he denied with an oath, I do not know the man. See, what we see right now is Peter's already beginning to slip. Do you see that? I don't know him. Stop it. Pressure's on. Flesh is getting weakened in this damsel girl. Out of everybody, how would you like to tell the disciples, you know, later in that story is like, Peter, I know you deny Jesus, but who was it that pressured you? Was it one of those Roman soldiers? The Bible says it was a, it was a little girl. That's, that's what it was. It was a damsel. It, it was just a servant girl that did this. Verse 73, and after a while it came unto him that stood by and said unto Peter, Surely thou art gone, or thou art one of them, and thy speech and it betrays you, is what it's saying, and began to curse and to swear, and saying, I know not the man, and immediately the cock crew. In that moment right there, sin stepped in. Now let me tell you, we can all look back on our failures or our faults, and it's different for every single one of us. But let me tell you, all of us have a story of messing up. 
You say, I, I don't want to talk. No, all of us have a story of messing up. It might not be the same as somebody else's story, but I tell you, it, it's easy because we're in the flesh, and it might be the fact that we had an abortion, or we, we were hung up on pornography, or we, we, we went to jail, or whatever it is. All of us have a story of messing up. And repeat, remember the words of Jesus, which was said unto him, before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me. And he went out and he wept bitterly. That wept bitterly literally means to weep violently. It's not even used in scripture very often. It, it literally comes from the word, root word bitter, which means to pierce through your inner being. This man was broken. And I, I, I want to say something that I, I think that maybe we don't understand. It could have been in this very moment that this is where Peter got his heart right. And, and I know there's debate about that as for what's going on. But he knew as soon as he did that, I messed up. And the Bible says that he went out and he was broken. This wasn't like Judas being broken. Judas regretted it, tried to get the money back. This is Peter that's broken inside of him. Peter was broken. That, that brokenness that leaves you all the joy out of you and, and, and you know that you let down Jesus. It stinks to let down Jesus. It stinks when you know to do right and you don't do right. When you tell Jesus you would do right and you don't do it. Peter is with the other disciples and, and turn to John chapter 21. We're getting closer to Acts. Another part of the gospel that gets us right there. John 21 and verse 3. Simon Peter saith unto them, I go fishing. And they said unto him, we also go with thee. And they went forth and entered into a ship immediately. And that night they caught nothing. Have you ever been there? I'm, I'm just being real. And I know none of this is new. For, we're, we're getting to the part where this con connects the dots here. But have you ever been in that part where you're just thinking, I, I, I've messed up and you're trying to just make the best of life? You know what I'm saying? You're, just, you're, you're, you're still there. He was with Jesus. The Bible says that Jesus was there in verse 1 of chapter 21. You're just trying to make the best of life. And you're sitting there saying, I, I'm, I'm getting nothing done. I'm frustrated. I'm irritated. I don't think I could get back in the choir, and I don't really want to be back in life group. I don't know really where I belong. All I know is that I can't do anything right. You talk about a spiritual battle happening inside of your heart and mind and being frustrated. He was broken. Peter was broken. He went back to do the only thing that he knew. There's a lot of debate why Peter went fishing. But I do know this. He was called to be a fisher of men, not a fisher of fish. It is so easy to retreat and just back off when we let down Jesus. But this gets to the good part. See, God not only knows your past, but God desires to restore you. John 21 is all about this. When morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore. The disciples knew not that it was Jesus. Then Jesus said unto them, children, have ye any meat? And they answered him, no. It was now morning time. Jesus comes on the shoreline. Now, this is a rhetorical question. Jesus already knew the answer, okay? Jesus knew that they didn't catch anything. But isn't it funny how God steps into our frustration? You know what I'm saying? They're out there, and I know that they love God and everything, but if you fished all night, you didn't catch one stinking fish all night. I guarantee they were kicking buckets and throwing nets around. It's just like, this is stupid. Peter, do you not know what you're doing? I know how to fish, man. I've done it my whole life. Oh, really? We've not caught one. This was your idea. Peter's just frustrated. And then Jesus steps up. Hey, how's it going? How, how many fish did you catch? Jesus already knowing that they didn't catch anything. Uh, uh, tell him, man. No, I don't want to tell him. He knows we've been out here all night. We've caught nothing. Nothing. Life can be awful when you are not where you should be. Life is unfulfilling when you are not where you should be. Joy is missing when you are not where you should be. And Jesus responds and said unto them, cast the net on the right side of the ship. Now, can we just put this in the perspective? This boat wasn't that big. 
They go from this side of the ship and all of a sudden, like, you want me to go literally five, six, eight feet to the other side and throw the net in and you think that's going to make a difference? And they did it. What was the whole point of what God was saying? Without me, you can do nothing. Church, can I say that again? Without God being the center of your life, nothing works out. It doesn't work. It's frustrating. It's irritating. And I am talking about Christians. I'm talking about followers of God. I'm talking about people that have messed up. The net was overflowing with 153 fish. I don't know why in the Bible he he decided to tell us that, but the Bible says there was 153 fish. The fish was overflowing out of this net. Peter jumps out of the boat. He runs to the, or swims to the shoreline. Notice what's going on here. The Bible says when it was now morning time. Now I'm going to tell you guys this, and this is just Pastor Tony. I can't prove this, but I'm just saying God came to him at that exact moment. What happens in the morning in a culture like that? Normally a wake-up call in a culture like that would be a rooster crowing. Have you guys ever messed up and then there's triggers that sit there and remind you of what you've done? That old girlfriend, you know, of people talking, those friends that you don't want to be around. It's like, man, I'm getting it. I, I don't want to be around that. It just reminds me of how I messed up. It reminds me of going to jail. It reminds me of being in drugs. It reminds me. I don't want to be around it. But for old Peter, every time the rooster would crow, it would be a reminder that you failed Jesus. And this morning was a little different. Jesus showed up instead of a rooster crying out to him. It was Jesus calling out to him. It's amazing how God shows up in our frustration because God knows our guilt and God knows our pain and God knows how it affects us. In John 21 verse 9, And as soon as they were come to land, he saw the fire of coals there and a fish laid thereof in the bread. Here's Jesus down making This dinner, now I'll tell you, we could sit there and say, okay, it's just a story in the Bible. Do you understand that everything that's happening right now is God calling Peter close to him? Did you guys see that? Peter runs from Jesus, gets in the boat, and says, I'm going to do the other thing. Jesus loves you enough. You get that? Jesus loves you enough, Christians, to stand there one way or the other and say, what are you doing? Come back. I want you over here. And when he sat him down into the amazing thing that we overlook of what happened in that passage, Jesus sat down with breakfast. Now that should make every Baptist shout right there. I was like, hey, that's right. If I'm going to hang out with Jesus, it wasn't just breakfast. Jesus made the breakfast. You can't complain about a breakfast that Jesus made. It had to be the best of the best. Jesus made this breakfast for them. They're sitting there. And he said literally like this, this is awesome. Come, come sit with me. I know that God is a God of judgment and God is a holy God. But can I remind you that we serve a very gracious God. He sits there and says, I know you're messed up and I know in your mind that you don't belong here. And Jesus sits there and says literally to Peter and says, come here. You know what's kind of cool about that passage? Some of you that have heard me teach on this before... That word coal is only used twice in Scripture in the Greek. It's only used twice. If you look that up in the Strongs or whatever you use and you click on it, there's only going to be two words. The other one is John 18, 18. You know where it was? And it says, and Peter warmed his hands at the coals before he denied Jesus. So all of a sudden, God brings him. God wasn't rubbing it in his face. God was bringing him back to his failure because you know what? You can't move on to confront what brought you down. Your pride and your arrogance, and it gets in our heads, and we run the other way saying, God's done with me. I damage goods. I'd be better off catching fish than following Jesus. I'm just done with this. I'm not good enough. Let me tell you, those are lies of the devil. And churches are filled with people that are just like Peter's. You love God. You want to serve God, but you have a past. You know your past. Maybe not everybody else knows your past, but it messes with your mind. Jesus sits them down, and you guys know the story. Jesus responds to him and says, Peter, do you love me? Do you understand? Do you love me? And the amazing thing of he was doing in that passage was telling him to feed his sheep. Now God confronts our sin. And God brings us, you don't understand what God's doing with this. And God confronting our sin. He brings us back into fellowship with him. Peter, come sit down. 
And then God, in that moment, begins to confront us, to remind us that we have been called to feed his sheep. We've been called into the ministry. I've called you to represent me. You are not damaged goods, and I am not done with you, Peter. I'm not done with you. The same thing that we read in the Bible of Jesus doing this is brought into our church in our day and age. Galatians 6.1 is the exact representation of this. Brethren, Christians, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Here, here let, me, let me just visualize this. Peter messed up. Okay? Peter messed up. And this is what we often do. We sit there and say, well, uh, we do that all the time. We sit there and write people off. We sit there and say, you, you're marked and you're scarred. And I know we struggle with this as Christians. I've had conversations. We, we struggle with this as Christians about restoration. Do you know where that word restore right there means? To put back and work in order? But in our minds, we have, you know, like premium and then messed up. We have a clearance aisle of Christians where they are damaged goods and they're not as worth as what they used to be worth. But God says, I, I need you that are spiritual. You know why God had to throw that in there about restoration of restoring those that are broken? Because in our minds, when we are in the flesh, we sit there and say they don't deserve it. Let me tell you, you're absolutely right. For by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourself. It is the gift of God. Where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. It's not about you deserving it. It's about Jesus covering your sin so that you could have what you don't deserve. This is what Jesus was doing in that moment. After he threw Peter behind the, the, the way back here. Uh, thought about that day of Pentecost. Because Peter didn't just go up there. It was the Spirit of God that was alive and working on that day. It was the Spirit of God that was working in that day. I don't get this. Because I feel like we have so many damaged pots in the background and no Christians are willing to reach in there and say, ye which are spiritual, restore. Because God never throws the pot away. God never throws the clay away. God never turns his back on us. God seeks us out. God knows our past. God desires to restore us, but Why? Did Peter preach on this day? Why Peter? God restores you so that he can be seen through you. You say, why did Peter preach on this day? He didn't earn the right. It wasn't according to his past. It wasn't about his flawlessness because the whole thing that God was doing was talking about the grace of God and the salvation of God. And God on that day is kind of like... All the disciples standing back there saying, hey, one of us needs to preach. And the Spirit of God going, Peter, not me. I don't deserve to be preaching. I don't deserve to, Peter. The Spirit of God rises us up, you know, what to do to restore us back to what he created us to be. And it doesn't matter what men say, and it doesn't matter what your labels are. It doesn't matter what your past says. And we can sit there and say, Peter, you're a denier of Jesus Christ. You were a liar. You cursed. You turned your back on God. You did all of these things. You don't deserve it. But God says in that moment, the whole presentation of the gospel is the fact that God forgives when you don't deserve to be forgiven. And God gives us grace when you don't deserve to have the grace of God. And God picks you up and God puts you back and God puts you back into the service. You know why? Because this is a visual. It's another visual. Peter was a visual. That God is a God of second chances. That's the message of day of Pentecost. That God restores when no man else would do it. That is the message of Pentecost. 
the message of Pentecost was the day that God was talking about the forgiveness of sin, where grace comes in and covers what was messed up in our lives, like the cross of Jesus Christ. Brutally beaten and messed up, and the Spirit of God restores people. Why did Peter preach on Pentecost? Because Peter is you, and Peter is me. And God raises, raises up the broken to say, I'm not done with the church, even though you've messed up. So I stand before a church full of Peters. And I need you to understand that God's not done with you. God was walking on the shoreline and he goes up to a man named Simon. He said, who is Simon? Oh, that's Peter. His name wasn't Peter yet. And God takes Simon and he walks and he says, Peter, I want you to follow me. And God changed his name in that moment going from Simon to Peter. Peter means rock. Peter's probably saying that I'm no rock, man. I'll tell you what, you've got this mixed up. I'm no rock. Peter denies Jesus Christ. And read the passage. When Jesus sits down with him, he calls him Simon. Simon, do you love me? Simon, do you love me? God was saying, you're running from what I created you to be. Some of you are running from what you've been created to be. God says to us, you are chosen, not forsaken. You are who I made you to be. You are my called. You are my preacher. You are saved and you are forgiven. And you are set free from whatever the past labels and sin that you had in your past. And when Peter walked to the stage on that day, he's not called Simon. He's not even called Simon Peter. But Peter, the one that was changed by the power of Jesus Christ. Jesus.